Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Thank you Madam Chairperson, thank you MSN for inviting me to give this topic. Transition from CKD to end stage kidney disease, shared decision making. To be honest, this is not an easy topic. Uh, it's not something like, you know, you can quote mortality studies, uh, you can quote uh, progression of kidney disease, how to reduce it, uh, because it is a soft topic. It is about patients. It is about patients' understanding and how we can deal with those. So I'll be focusing on shared decision making and using CKD uh, to end stage kidney disease examples. This is an overall diagram of how transition from CKD to end stage kidney disease is. Um, so you have few options there. So you have you have dialysis option, either hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. You have transplantation option, and you have a comprehensive conservative care option. Seems pretty straightforward. Um, seems like you know anybody can give this option to the patient. Or are we? My question is, if we are doing so well with all the management and transition from CKD to end stage. How come there are many young people who never heard about transplant? And there are a lot of discrepancy between hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, despite you know, the benefit and risk of both of them. And there are many people whom we are following up for months and years, but yet when they start dialysis, they still require IJC. And this is a bit overkill, but there are some dissatisfaction in some part of our services that we have to acknowledge. So why is this still happening if we think that it is so straightforward? The core element behind the shared decision making is the patient's autonomy. Uh, because we as physicians we really don't know what the patient, what the patients want. Uh, so for example, we wouldn't know what's the goal of therapy uh, in their minds. We don't know their priorities, we don't know their emotional need, and we don't know the context of their decision-making process. Um, so that's why patient's autonomy becomes really important. And, and in contrast, previously we have these physician's beneficence, which means that we want to do something which is the best that we think of for our patients. Um, it is a right to choose what we think is the best for the patient. And often we disregard or without considering what the patient wants. Uh, uh, compared to the patient's autonomy when you know they are, the right of a patient is to choose medical care without influence from doctors. So this tug of war between physicians' beneficence and patients' autonomy often resulted in not so nice outcome. Hence, um, they have this shared decision making, which is a middle path of both autonomy as well as physicians' beneficence. It is a process during which patient, caregiver and healthcare professionals relate to and influence each other as they collaborate in making decisions. So the physician brings about the evidence of certain choices, you know, HD, PD or um, conservative care, and the patients bring about their own values and objective and how they are see this world. And we try to combine this understanding of the two and then come up with the appropriate decision. So you may ask, you know, why should I deal with this, you know, shared decision making or something new? I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing now. Uh, actually, the shared decision making is not something new, although the terminology is coined in the 80s, that was like 30 years ago, but the idea has been there for a few decades before that. So the evidence have shown that doing shared decision making improved the knowledge of a patient, the patient will feel better informed and clearer about what matters most to them. And this is quite logical actually. And there's a more accurate expectation of benefit and harm because this is when the physician tells the patient what a good thing, what a bad thing, and the, and the patients participate more in the decision making. Those are the, from the Cochrane Review in 2014 and there are many other benefits that we can think of 
all the researchers have uh, mentioned. For example, it reduces anxiety among patients every time they come and see doctors. They reduce inequalities in disadvantaged group. They also may reduce the litigation risk, uh, litigation risk, which may some of us may be interested in. And then overall, some of the study shows it may reduce the overall cost. Talking about negligence, we all should be familiar with Bollum tests, which states that um, it is not considered negligence if if a doctor act in accordance with a practice accepted as proper by a responsible body of skillful persons, meaning that if his colleagues think that what he did was right, even though it causes patients um, problem, then that still be okay. Now, in 2015, uh, there's a case involving obstetrician who deliver a baby with shoulder dystocia and was sued because the mother says uh, she was never given an option of C-section. Although the doctor's reply is that if I give that option, then everybody would want to do C-section. But the UK Supreme Court uh, ruled that the standard of risk, benefits and alternative treatments provided by physicians are now to be determined by what a reasonable patient would deem important rather than a reasonable physician. Of course, physician's opinion is important, but we have to speak to the patient and understand what are the real risks and material risks relevant to the patient's situation. You may ask, aren't we practicing this already? You know, I have practiced this in, our, in, my, in my clinic, and I would say that's very good of you. Uh, because the evidence says that in Malaysia overall, we are still very lacking in our interpersonal skills. In a large um, study done in MOH hospital, um, in outpatient setting, uh, patients are quite satisfied with the technical quality and the accessibility to the outpatient um, department. But you can see uh, we are doing quite poor in the respect of interpersonal skills, our communication, our interpersonal manner, and our, the time spent with the doctors are uh, really poor. Hence, um, based on one of the uh, pioneers of SDM in uh, Malaysia, uh, Professor Dr. Ng uh, in UM, so he reported that there appears to be a little training or research of SDM in Malaysia that was in 2013. And then subsequently, uh, his colleague uh, says that the current state of SDM in Malaysia is still at its infancy that was in 2017. So we are still uh, not at par with other countries as regard to the shared decision making. And that's not the only barrier. So, you know, number one is basically the physician may felt that they have done the best, so they should not adopt the shared decision making process and there are other barriers coming from the patient and coming from the clinician for example the patient may felt that you know the the the, the they need to relate to the family every time they need to make a decision and the values may be different from each patient to another uh, they, they there's a different control you know certain patient does not want to make ultimate decision while another patient may want to have a full decision on their own without involving the doctors and from the doctor's point of view we're going to study this uh, more clearly later on so you know the communication particularly how do we communicate with the patient may become a barrier in having a successful um, SDM or shared decision making Prof Ng also reported the five important cultural mediators in Malaysia uh, that was in 2015 and number one on his list is our language barrier. We live in the multicultural societies where we all, we all have a, our own um, different language and for communication skill to happen or communication to happen, we really need to understand each other and uh, without understanding each other and especially when we speak in a different language, then obviously there will be a barrier there. There's also a, a medical paternalism um, quite prevalent in Malaysia. Uh, our community or our, 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 our people are still in the process of adapting and accepting shared decision making because many of them actually are still very happy uh, for the doctors to make decision uh, for them. Uh, although that's 
if everybody is happy, that's not necessarily a problem. But we know worlds are changing into more of a shared decision making, and I think this is coming to Malaysia. Uh, a strong family bond, having a, a, a religious kind of a, a reference, uh, quite good actually, in my opinion, because uh, we have a lot of help um, surrounding our patient. As we got to the complementary medicine, I think we all aware that there are a few studies lately, 2019 from UM, 2021 from UPM, saying that CKD and dialysis patient, almost 60 to 80 percent of them are actually taking complementary medicine. So how to practice this in our day-to-day -day, um, consultation? Okay, so this is where I'm going to get into the CKD and end-stage kidney disease. Number one, and I cannot stress this strong enough, that physician has to be good at communicating with the patient. Uh, it's in the past where we just look at numbers, where we do rounds without talking to our patients. We should nowadays that, you know, we should talk to them, we should discuss with them. Uh, it may take a little bit, it, it may take minutes longer compared to the usual looking at numbers and computers, but I think we should. Uh, like Abel in 2017 mentioned in his paper that physicians have been asked to be good communicators without being taught how to do so effectively. And th this is very true. Although we do have some training in undergraduate and postgraduate, I think it's far uh, than enough. In our nephrology fraternity, uh, the shared decision making has been mentioned uh, for quite some time. For example, in this special article, uh, in the year 2000, you know, we actually have a clinical practice guideline of shared decision making in making appropriate initiation of and withdrawal from dialysis. And even in our Malaysian CKD guideline in 2018, it did mention about shared decision making, where it says shared decision making, shared decision, oh, it's so difficult, shared decision making and close collaboration between different levels of healthcare should be implemented in the management of CKD locally. So how do we implement this? Shared decision making, generally speaking, is about normal decision making process so we're all familiar with this you know in order to make decision the easiest way is either yes or no or not do, not making decision or maybe right so or in you know previously when we uh, do a proper uh, decision making counseling so we have to identify the problem know what's the good and bad about all the options that we have and take the take the action and then re-evaluate back so shared decision making is doing all this but together with the, with the patients. So it's not so easy actually because uh, uh, if we do decision on our own, we know all the pros and cons and we know the objective and so that's easy. But now imagine that you know patient does not know the pros and cons and they, they require us to tell them or to discuss with them about what's good and what's bad. But we also don't know what the patient want because each patient wants different things. So that's when we really need to sit together and then discuss about how are we going to do this or what decision are we going to make. Uh, so in order to address this, researchers have come up with many models, not related just to the CKD population, but in general, how to make shared decision making. But it's still the basic process is there, you know, identify the goals of a patient, identify what are the options, we discuss about the options and come up with a solution or come up with a decision. So I quite like this remap model. Uh, by Ch Childers in 2017, where R stands for reframe, E expect emotion, M map out goals, A align with goals, and P propose a plan. So basically, uh, sometimes patient doesn't really know that they require dialysis, and we are the one who need to tell them. You know, for example, you know, we have tried so many things, and your GFR is still declining, or your GFR has reached you know very low, ready five or four, and I think we should start discussing when to initiate dialysis. Things like that, you know, give the patient a bigger picture that things are coming and you have to do something about it. And you would expect emotion from the patient, uh, just like when you're breaking bad news. So patient may say that, you know, I'm feeling okay, so why should I follow you or why should I initiate dialysis? 
or maybe in denial saying that you know um, there must be something else I can do can I take this can I take that and that's why I think it is important for us to start this quite early not just waiting for when the dialysis is happening and then you map out the goals after patient understand that there's a big decision needs to be made and then we ask them you know what's your objective what do they want um, can they see themselves doing dialysis next year or next couple of months are they worried about starting dialysis? What are, they, what are their worries? So these needs to become these needs to be discussed with the patient, uh, and then after knowing, you know, what are the options and what do they want, uh, then we can reflect back on the patient because most of the time we don't really do this. I mean, we just give them option and they choose and then that's it. So we want to make sure that when we make decision or suggest a decision to them we understand what they want so we may say that you know if the in the patient where they don't want dialysis regardless of what happens we may say you know if i'm correct you say that you do not want dialysis and even when your life is in danger you rather be with your family instead of coming to the hospital and initiate dialysis and they may say yes to this and that's quite clear cut and then after understanding what do they want and the options they have then we may propose a plan to them uh, aligning with their goals and objective so for example in patient who does not want dialysis then we may say that we will refer them to a doctor that will look after their need without putting them through that dialysis when we talk to patients uh, and we try to understand them uh, we need to know as well that there are certain things that we need to do first. Number one is to know whether they have a mental capacity to understand what we are discussing or not. Some of them may have depression, anxiety that we may need to go slow with them. Um, different level of health literacy as well may affect our conversation with patients. Some are really good, some even doctors that can understand many things. Unfortunately, some also may need a lot of guidance from us and from the family members uh, to come up with a good decision. Uh, elderly particularly, they may be slow in replying to us in, in understanding what we're saying and sometimes we have to use a, a language that they understand. I use this a lot okay I, th I found this very uh, beneficial for me because there are a lot of patients who comes and to be honest when they hear that they've been referred to nephrology or kidney doctor for their kidney damage the f I think one of the first thing they think in their mind is that do I need dialysis so this um, calculation is is important for me to give them some idea especially if they are at stage three because that kind of ease them a little bit saying that you know you're not at the immediate risk to be needing dialysis yet so for example if i was referred a patient of 75 year old male with a gfr of 35 and urine albumin uh, is equivalent roughly about one gram so based on this calculation at two years they are at four percent risk of needing dialysis or transplant and at five years, there are about 15% risk. So are these high or low? So it says here that you know, if you have a 5% risk over five years, you should see a kidney doctor, which the patient is saying me. Uh, if you have a 10% risk over two years, then you should be seen in a multidisciplinary team to be counseled and everything. Uh, not yet at this stage. And then if you have a 20% risk in two years, you should be planning for dialysis like creating fistula or planning for transplant which not yet at this risk and you know when patient sees this number it give them a, at least a little bit of an objective values of do i need dialysis in the next one or two years or they're still good for me i mean they're still many times for me and i think this this is a good um, uh, beginning to start off um, uh, a conversation with a patient Educating patients can be really important uh, when we talk about shared decision making. Uh, Dr. Kalisa reported that ideally education sessions should last less than 15 minutes and only address three to five points, which I think is a bit impractical uh, because we know how busy our clinic is. And imagine if we only address like, you know, a few points um, on a short period of time, we will need a lot of sessions in the clinic. And it is something that we cannot afford because we just don't have time. We have a lot of administrative duties, um, uh, especially those in the government um, hospital, uh, which makes us, you know, rushing for time. Uh, we also don't have enough manpower uh, because I would say ideally patients should be seeing similar doctors every time they come, especially when they want to make important decisions like this. Uh, but 
you know, we know that's not happening uh, unless you are in the private um, uh, in the private setting. Uh, and imagine if you are seeing a different doctors every time we come to the clinic. Uh, we have to start all over from the beginning. We don't know their patient expectation as doctors and patient doesn't know our expectation. So that can be really difficult and prolong the process of making them understand what we want them to understand. And that's when we should have some kind of a standardized education, which I think the ministry is trying to do. So we should have a multidisciplinary team uh, consists of, you know, specialist nurse, nephrologist, dietitian, social worker, and some of them are having pharmacists as well in there. And I think uh, nephrologist is very bad at doing this. Uh, so it has to be, I think, uh, spearheaded by the specialist nurse who basically they are the one who give counseling, who created the the the. Uh, education materials and all those things and because they can take time outside the clinic session so that they can do all these education session so that that really save time on the clinic only address matters which are important most uh, and then let the education and other things uh, be done on the outside of the clinic setting uh, this can be delivered in the individual group uh, individual setting as well as a group setting as well because we know group setting may be good when the information is very generic well if you want to make a proper decision you know what to do palliative care dialysis uh, no dialysis uh, it has to be done in the individual one-to-one um, -one session you can use a lot of material book left leaflet videos and dv i'm not sure whether we are using dvd anymore but anyway youtube online material there are a lot of them and we should utilize all of those and and there comes a way of how to do this um, like i said before you know ideally the researchers say that you know 15 minutes over three to five points on the end i know that's not practical hence all around the world people have come up with a different timing and different sessions for example i think in ispd they did mention about having a six one hour session teaching uh, or another method is four weekly or over four weeks where you have two hour session every week in the UK they actually previously had education day where every three months they have these you know um, uh, telling patients you know they, they gather patients with CKD or entering dialysis uh, telling them what to be expected and they actually have a module for this which is very good so we sh we should try to imitate all these so that we can we can take uh, we can use a clinic time only to discuss matter which are the most important uh, by the doctors and then take a more generic kind of a role of educating patients um, outside the clinic time this is a picture that was put in the live magazine in 1962 um, often when we discuss dialysis and conservative care and transplant with a patient, you know, they, they, they view dialysis as something which is a burden to them. And for those patients who kind of, uh, you know, you gauge that they actually want dialysis, uh, but uh, they're afraid of dialysis, then I use this point. Basically, I say to them that uh, 60 years ago, if we're living during that time, then we don't really have much option. Uh, if you fail the kidney, then death um, uh, death will come because we don't really have dialysis. Even in this particular case in Seattle, where these six persons uh, actually decide who live, meaning who will get dialysis, and who will die, meaning who will not get dialysis. And we don't have to think about this way uh, this time. So we should be thankful to a certain extent that we de we do have dialysis nowadays okay but that's from my point of view it's easy for me to say because you know that's what i think but what are the patient's point of view um, uh, the morton rl in 2010 has come up in you know issues that patient may be thinking when we discuss about end-stage kidney therapy with them for example they may be thinking about their death you know would i die uh, lack of choices, gaining knowledge of options, and weighing uh, alternative. So, in their own words, patient may say when they talk about, you know, when when they think about dialysis, is that you know, I got too much going on, hence I cannot die now. So that's why I want dialysis. Or they may say that you know, my children are all grown up, and they have their own families to look after. 
hence um, I don't want to be a burden to them so I prefer not having dialysis uh, and then some of them are really kind of in limbo where or even we are we cannot be sure you know they we cannot tell them how long are you going to live if you choose certain material certain certain uh, dialysis modality or conservative care in generally speaking now it could be that patients are uh, limited with their choices of uh, renal replacement therapy there may be patients who want transplant but they are like 80 years old or they have a lot of comorbidities uh, there may be a plenty of patients who were put on hemodialysis straight because it was crash landed without being told about peritoneal dialysis and there may be patients who are limited in their choice in the sense that they cannot do hemodialysis because of a poor heart so they can only do peritoneal dialysis gaining knowledge so um, there may be patients who basically decide their dialysis modality based on what their friends or the, what their families are thinking you know they may be like you know uh, their friends died during hemodialysis or their father died during peritoneal dialysis so they really don't want those um, as well as they may be thinking about you know, their children whether children are too busy cannot take to the hd centers uh, and then some of them are thinking about the work after dialysis so what i'm trying to say is that patients had a lot more to think about compared to our simplistic mind you know it's easy dialysis no dialysis conservative care just pick uh, you have three or four or five options to choose so it's not necessary like that and without talking to the patients we won't be able to know what are their goals and what are their objectives because shared decision making is very soft is a soft topic and and whether we like it or not there's no definitive definition of what is shared decision making so it will be useful to know how people assess what is shared decision making so that you know in our mind we can understand these are the criteria or these are the things that we should do in order for us to be considered as doing shared decision making so for example this is one of the famous one i like this one because this has been translated into malay in 2015. so these are the validated series of nine questions asking patients and it will be called sdm q9 uh, on how the doctors approach them for example uh, you can see you know uh, number one my doctor made clear that a decision needs to be made uh, or you know my doctor helped me understand all the information my doctor and i thoroughly weighed the different treatment options and my doctor and i reached an agreement on how to proceed so it give you it give us a doctor uh, some objective um, uh, things on what is um, shared decision making another version which is a shorter and still they really deliver or really address the crux of the matter of shared decision making uh, they will be asking the patients on how much effort was made to help you understand your health issue how much effort was made to listen to the things that matter most to you about your health issue and how much effort was made to include what matters most to you in choosing the option or choosing what to do next and this is the key things in shared decision making so those are my talk I hope I have been clear about what is short, uh, shared decision making and I'm sure you can't wait to apply this in your day-to-day -day consultation with your patients uh, for those who are feeling a little bit of um, you know not sure uh, because you have to add more time just remember that you know this is an opportunity for us to connect with our patients to show our care and respect and to trust them and ultimately we want to help them to protect their interests in order to choose what's best for them with that i thank you